was from his collection of old license plates. They also find out that he has been arrested just the year earlier for assaulting a 21-year-old college girl, and he ended up serving three months for this. This victim, unfortunately, wasn't Ben's first victim. They find out that he has had a lot of troubled relationships with young college girls. One young woman was choked by Ben, but she never came forward to press charges. And another woman reported being smothered with a pillow by Ben. Neither incident was ever reported to law enforcement. So when he had first been interviewed by police, he did say that he had sex with Taylor, who was a minor. He admitted to this. But he said he didn't see her the day she went missing, and now they have footage of him hanging out in her door. So police bring Ben in. And he says, well, he actually did see her, but it was just for a couple minutes. And then, like, she went her way, and he went his, and he didn't see her again. But police don't really believe Ben. During his first interview, remember, he had this, like, elaborate, over-the-top story about being attacked by strangers. Something just didn't sit right with officers, so they decide to get a search warrant for Ben's home. They search the home, and they end up taking a lot of evidence, including knives, S&M paraphernalia, and several computers and CD-ROMs, like burnable CDs. On these computers, they find thousands of images, like he's a photographer. There's just so many pictures to go through. However, it doesn't take them long to find child pornography on Ben's computer. And not only is there child pornography, there is a lot of child pornography. These are a very very, very young children. So he is arrested on these child pornography charges. But he has this whole story about how he had this old neighbor, an older man who died and left him the computers and he didn't even know that there was pornography on them. Along with the pornography found, police find that he has been selling this porn on eBay, so he would burn it onto a burnable, like, DVD, CD, disc, and then he would write on it, and they matched his handwriting on these CDs. So, he is held on these child pornography charges. And while they've definitely gotten a pedophile off the streets, they still don't know where Taylor is, and they have no way to tie him to Taylor's disappearance. But given this Ben's history, they feel like he is definitely involved somehow, so they keep digging. They are going through all of these thousands of photos on his computer that he's taken for his, like, photography business, and they're trying to match the backgrounds to locations because they figure Taylor may be at a location that is known to Ben. It's unlikely that he would take her somewhere he had never been before. So they're trying to look for pictures that are taken in like isolated or rural areas and trying to figure out if they can pinpoint that location. 
she'll take them to her parents' property, which is in Matthews County, about an hour and a half drive from the campus. So they arrive, and it's like a big wooded, super rural area, and they ask Aaron to stay in the car. They get out, and they just kind of start walking, and soon they are hit with the smell of human decomposition, and it doesn't take them long to find the remains of Taylor Bill just laying on the ground with a little bit of boilage scattered over her remains. So this case quickly turns from a missing person's case to a homicide. Taylor's remains were taken to the medical examiner's office. Now, Taylor had been outside, exposed to the elements for over a month, so there wasn't a lot for the Emmy to work with. The remains consisted mostly of bones. There was a very little soft tissue remaining. However, when Taylor was last seen, she was wearing a black hoodie, and this black hoodie was found over the remains. There was evidence on this hoodie that her wrists had been tied with duct tape at one point. Because of the condition of her remains, the medical examiner was never able to determine a cause of death. Ben, who they think is responsible, is already in prison, and if convicted of all of these child pornography charges, he's looking at like 90 years. So they know he's not going anywhere, but they still want to close this case. So they go to Ben and they tell him, look, you could be in prison for 90 years on all of these charges. So why don't you just come clean and tell us what happened to Taylor? And he surprises them by agreeing. And then he gives his confession. He says that Taylor showed up at his apartment unexpected the night that she went missing. And she's super upset. Her boyfriend has broken up with her and she's just angry. She wants revenge. She wants to do something to him. And she's also rambling about doing something illegal. They then have sex at Ben's apartment before going to Taylor's dorm to get her keys so they can leave in her car because she is determined to do something illegal. And Ben says this whole time he's trying to calm her down. He's trying to talk her out of it. So when she grabs her keys, she also grabs this piece of paper that she has printed off the internet. And it is instructions about a sexual game called Breath Play. Breath Play is basically erotic asphyxiation. Ben claims he had never done this with Taylor before, although they had engaged in bondage style sex. And he's really uncomfortable. He doesn't want to take it to this level. But she is angry and she's pushing him. And at one point he claims that she said, if you don't do this with me, I'm going to tell the police you raped me and I'm a minor, so you're going to get in trouble. So he agrees. He said they were both really, really high. They had been taking oxys. They had been drinking a lot. And things just kind of got out of hand. He said Taylor wanted him to tie her wrists and ankles up and choke her until she passed out. And so he did. And then she was just passed out in the back of her car. So he gets in the driver's seat and drives back to campus. But about halfway there, he realizes Taylor's no longer breathing. He claims she was breathing when he got into the front of the car. But then she just stopped breathing. And he freaks out. He doesn't know what to do. So he goes back to his apartment, leaving her in the car. 
and decides to just get drunk and try to figure out what to do. Then he said he was just still panicked, didn't know what to do, so he decided to just take her out and dump her body on his ex-girlfriend's property and leave. So, Ben's confession doesn't seem to be true or entirely true because the detectives are saying if she died in that car, if there was a dead body in that car, even for one minute, the cadaver dogs would have hit on it. So there's no way she died in that car. And he's like, well, I cleaned it out with bleach. But again, A, they would have been able to smell bleach and they couldn't. And her car had fabric seats, so if he had poured bleach all over him, he would have been able to tell. Now, police don't have a confirmed cause of death in Taylor's case, so it's a little bit trickier to take that to trial to prove she was murdered when they don't know how she died. So Ben is offered a plea deal in exchange for Ben pleading guilty to second-degree murder, they would drop all of the child pornography charges. On August 9th, 2006, he entered a plea to second-degree murder. Matthew County Circuit Court Judge William H. Shaw sentenced him to 30 years in prison. Later, this lawyer would come forward to say that he had looked at Taylor's toxicology report and he thinks Ben wasn't to blame. This lawyer saw that Effexor was found in the toxicology report that was done on Taylor's remains. This is an antidepressant and some possible side effects of this drug can be reduced sexual pleasure and also suicidal thoughts. Taylor's mom said that she was prescribed the drug and she had been taking it for a while. So, could Taylor's death have been caused by a combination of drug and alcohol use? Ben says he has no motive for killing Taylor, but he does place himself with her when she died. Ben is at least partially to blame here because he was with her and he didn't call 911 or try to get her help when he realized she was no longer breathing. His plea was upheld. He wasn't released because of this toxicology information. Whether it was an accident or a murder, the truth is he did not try to help her. He didn't call 911. He went and hid her body and then just went about his normal life. Plus, this guy is a pedophile. What I think happened is they met up willingly because we know Taylor was not abducted and maybe they were having sex and maybe things got out of hand and he was being too rough with her and A, he killed her on accident, he strangled her and killed her, or B, she said that she was going to tell police that he was raping her, which he said to police in his statement had happened, and he snapped and killed her so that she couldn't. One thing that I think this case really reinforces is the importance of victims of sexual crimes to come forward and report them. Now, I've never been a victim of a sexual crime, so I'm I'm trying to not say I know what it's like and how scary that could be and how dramatic that could be to report it. However, if police don't know about a bad guy because he's not on their radar because he's choking people all over campus, then it just increases the chances that he will victimize more people. I hope that that made sense. Something that really bothers me in this case